Okay, so welcome to the late this version of the IQUIST seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Greg Fuchs from Cornell's uh, Applied and Engineering Physics Department. Uh, Greg comes to us through his you know background education and training through uh, a PhD at Cornell Applied and Engineering Physics to postdoctoral work at Santa Barbara, back to a faculty position in, in Ithaca. Uh, and his his work, you know, crosses between and intersect or takes advantage of both quantum information science and spintronics. And he's working, you know, at the intersection uh, between atomic physics, material science, and electrical engineering. So welcome, Greg, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, uh, so a couple things. So first of all, I'm really delighted to be here. I feel like uh, I've only been here once before for one of the spin colorotronics meetings, and uh, I'm going to talk about some of that that overlaps. Um, so let me just start by expanding a little bit on David's introduction um, to try for you to get to know me a little bit and the way that I approach these problems, because um, my group has a little bit of a split personality. So part of my group is interested in what I would just call magnetism and condensed matter physics. So spintronics is part of that. Um, we're interested in doing magnetic microscopy. We're interested in magnetic materials and making magnetic devices. Um, and then another part of my group has been strongly focused on what I would call quantum information science hardware. So we're kind of take a condensed matter physics approach. We look at interactions, but it's in the, the realm of trying to produce things that are gonna be interesting for quantum information technologies and devices. And our main kind of workhorse in that system are uh, spins and diamond. Um, and we're, we're very interested in like making resonators and things that interact with those spins. Um, but we're also, and you'll hear more about this, interesting, interested in sort of discovering new systems that are like the well-known color centers in diamond and silicon carbide um, in different materials. So these were very sort of separate research programs. And I had students that were like magnetism students and students that were sort of quantum students and uh, you know, kind of ran in parallel tracks. Um, and, and what's been fun is in the last couple of years, I've been trying to make those tracks sort of converge in, together in interesting ways. And so that's some of what you're gonna hear about today. So uh, I, I like to give the acknowledgements before the talk begins because uh, you know, otherwise you know, that I might forget at the end. And this is the most important thing because these are the people who did the actual research. Um, so here's my group. This is our summer picnic um, in, in, in beautiful Ithaca on you know, the shore of Lake Cayuga. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two things. Um, I'm gonna talk about magnons and gallium nitride defects. So here's the folks that did the work on magnons. Um, most of it is done by Chin Shu in my group and then uh, gallium nitride defects, uh, Jilun Lu. Um, important to also acknowledge the collaborators. So the magnetic material that we work with is um, from Zeke Johnson Halperin's group at Ohio State University, um, some theory support uh, by Michael Flatte's group um, at the University of Iowa, and then um, also people at Cornell, uh, Farhan Rana worked together with us on the gallium nitride work. Okay. So, so that, and then of course, let's not forget the people that provided the resources to do the, do the studies. So here is the outline of my presentation. I'm gonna talk about two very different things. I'm not even trying to make them connected. Um, I'm just trying to appeal to different parts of this audience. So uh, in the first case, we'll look at magnetism and whether or not is the question that we're interested in is, can magnetism and spintronic devices be interesting in the context of quantum technologies? Um, and so I'll show you some new approaches to looking at a field called cavity magnonics, where you uh, couple strongly a magnetic excitation with a photonic excitation in the microwave regime. Um, and then the second part of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about our very recent discovery of a new kind of quantum defect or color center in uh, a different material, gallium nitride. And so I'll show you that you can in fact get high quality optically detected magnetic resonance um, in this material. 
Okay, so let's start by a general topic. And the general topic um, I think about as a kind of starting point or an inspiration point for a lot of my group's work. And the idea here is the idea of a hybrid quantum system and why this is interesting. Um, so what I'm showing you in the picture is what I would consider the kind of like Lego of uh, some kind of quantum device. So it, it's not just one Lego piece, it actually has two pieces. You have uh, some kind of two-level system, so I'll call that the qubit, and uh, you know that that provides a lot of things that you need in quantum information sciences. It provides a nonlinearity. Um, you can use it to do logic, and of course you can you can have many different types, uh, right? You can make it a superconducting qubit. You could make it a quantum dot. Could be based on charge. Could be based on spin, um, or you could have something like a defect spin. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that you can make a qubit. Um, then, you know, you need some kind of way to interact with the outside world. Um, so that's often done through a resonator of some kind, some kind of harmonic oscillator. Um, for instance, in the superconducting qubit world, you use dispersive qubit readout. So you read uh, how the properties of this resonator depend on this qubit as a way of understanding what's going on with the qubit. Um, you can use it as an interconnect. So it can connect to other things. Um, it can be a good memory. And there's many different versions of harmonic oscillators. It doesn't have to be a microwave electromagnetic cavity. It could be an optical cavity. It could be an acoustic wave type of a cavity. Um, or as we'll see, it could be a magnon kind of a cavity. And then of course, what makes this hybrid is that these things don't have to all be the same as each other. So it's very interesting in classical technologies to connect different kinds of materials and devices made out of different materials with different properties to in each case for each task, be able to select the best thing. But then the challenge becomes, how do I make them talk to each other? Okay, so for instance, one thing that I might wanna do is I might wanna connect to a different kind of qubit, one that's more um, appropriate for discussing the, its quantum information with an optical photon, for example. So th this is the kind of high level motivation um, for hybrid quantum systems. Now, uh, what I'm gonna tell you about today is our work in cavity magnonics, which is not that, it's a simpler version um, in which we don't have a qubit and a, uh, a microwave resonator. What we have is a low damping magnet, which itself is a harmonic oscillator and a microwave resin. And the reason that we're doing this is that this is the zeroth order step, okay? We wanna really understand how these two very different systems can interact with each other, how we can engineer this coupling and think about their dissipation. Once we've built up that toolbox, then we can move towards um, these, these higher goals. All right, um, so I wanna just introduce this field of cavity magnetics. It certainly isn't something that we invented. In fact, we're somewhat latecomers to the party. Um, so there's lots of work that people have done and some recently beautiful review papers that if you're interested in this topic, I recommend that you check out. Um, people are interested in this for a variety of different reasons. It's just uh, an interesting set of, of uh, things that you can do with it. They include sensing, um, accessing non-reciprocal properties, which is something that comes along with magnetism. Um, Non-Hermitian effects come in, which is also provides a unique uh, tool set um, in a variety of different contexts. Um, the things that I would point though is that the basic ingredients are all the same. We have some kind of microwave resonator, which is as simple as an LC resonator, like you learned about uh, you know, in freshman physics, and, and magnons. And they're coupled together usually inductively. Um, so uh, the regime in which uh, the interesting physics emerge is the strong coupling regime. Um, that's the case in which the LC resonator, which is associated with some damping rate or kind of interchangeably line width, okay? Um, and the magnons, which are associated with some damping rate, those rates of dissipation have to be smaller than the coupling rate between these two systems. Okay, now if in the case of just two harmonic oscillators, this is the same as this. 
the coupled pendulum that we all learned in you know mechanics. So the coupling is related to the spring that connects the two systems. And, and the only difference between the pendulum and our cavity magnetic system is that these are just very different kinds of excitations. Okay, that's, that's all the difference. Um, so we often, for instance, characterize the strongly coupled system that we seek in terms of a ratio of the coupling. Um, G squared is the, the square of this coupling rate and the product of these two damping rates. And when this cooperativity exceeds one, then we say that we enter that regime. In, in, in general, we actually want both of these damping rates to be smaller uh, than this coupling rate. That's ideally. Okay, so that's what we're after. Um, and I want to start by just, as I said, I'm actually somewhat of a latecomer to this field. So I, I think it's worth looking at what came before to try to understand um, how we took our approach to this problem. So uh, most of the work, I would say, at about the 80% level is based on one kind of material. And that material is YIG, yttrium iron garnet. And it's in fact, one specific form of YIG, which is bulk YIG, carefully polished into a millimeter size sphere. So this is what they look like right here. Um, this is some pioneering work from the Nakamura group. You can see this is like almost 10 years old now. Um, what they did is they took a 3D microwave cavity. They mounted the YIG sphere in the cavity. The uniform mode excitation of the spins in this YIG sphere is one of the resonators. And the other resonator is the cavity itself. Um, you can see they made the cavity out of copper because you need to apply a magnetic field to tune the two systems to the same frequency. So their resonant excitations are at the same frequency. And when they do that, they see this beautiful avoided crossing feature, which is also a feature of the pendulum that I showed you on the last slide. Um, you get really nice results here. Um, so this is actually still somewhat of a world record result. Um, so the YIG line width is about one megahertz. Um, that is quite good. It is reasonably close, but not at the kind of uh, material, what people think of as the material viscous damping limit of YIG, at least at room temperature. Um, the, the coupling, which is given the sort of separation between these modes, um, is, is greatly enhanced by the fact that this is a millimeter scale. So there's a lot of spins in there. Um, but, and they're able to get cooperativities of, of a, a few thousand, um, which is great. And they've even gone a little farther, which is coupled a YIG sphere um, to a qubit, which they insert into the cavity um, through the, the cavity. So it's really, really a, a remarkable set of experiments. Um, one of the challenges to this, and one of the reasons why we're deciding to do different things, is that ultimately, if you want to try to think about going more complicated than one cavity and one magnon source or one, one magnonic resonator, then you're sort of stuck because you have to have this copper cavity and that's it. Um, you, you can't scale very far on that basis. So other people realized that before. And uh, you know, there's been a lot of nice work also based on planar superconducting devices. Um, and that includes work from the Hoffman group uh, before he moved here to UIUC. Um, so the typical idea there is, and what I'm showing is actually um, from Hans Feibel's paper in 2013, so now really one decade ago, this was the first experimental paper, um, in which uh, you make a superconducting resonator and you just put a piece of YIG on it. So it's just kind of like a flip chip sort of thing. And uh, you can get them to couple inductively that way. And so here's you know, my avoided level crossing that you get in that, in that kind of a system. Um, people have tried to make this smaller, right? This is a sort of macroscopic size. This is a microscopic size where they make a different design of resonator and they kind of fib out a little piece of YIG and they transfer it very carefully with an AFM on there. Um, very, very impressive stuff. Um, in both of these cases, you see they're not getting the one megahertz line width that's accessible with these bulk YIG spheres. So something is happening 
maybe at the material level, maybe it's some, for some other reason that we don't yet understand, that is limiting the performance of this magnetic system of these magnetic excitations um, when you don't have this bulk grown YIG sphere. So that's one of the challenges. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the Hoffman group said, okay, let's try to integrate the system. So you can take uh, you know, materials that you can deposit directly on the superconductor because I think we can all agree that pick and place is not also not a very scalable approach. Um, so you can try to integrate. So this is based on a nickel iron alloy permalloy that all the magnetics people in the room know is kind of like the copper of the magnetics world. Um, and uh, you can do it also with these low damping cobalt iron alloys. This all is great. It works very nicely. But again, uh, the damping of the magnon system starts to become really large. Um, and this is limited by kind of fundamental things. So the question is, how do we deal with low damping? How do we get that and not suffer some of the materials problems? So let's just take a pause and think about what actually determines this damping. So what, what determines magnon line? And I, I apologize if this appears pedagogical, but I think it's something that we need to examine and re-examine frequently because I think a lot of our central dogma might be wrong. So this is the way that people uh, typically write it out for low temperature line. So you have uh, this term that's frequency dependent. This is called the Gilbert damping. It's regarded as materials dependent. Um, and many people think of this as intrinsic damping because it's viscosity. However, uh, nobody actually knows where it comes from in a magnetic insulator, and they have no idea what the temperature dependence of it is. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, then you can have magnon scattering. Uh, that happens when, um, you know, a magnon, for instance, uh, if I have my uniform mode magnon, which is this one, and all the spins are processing together, uh, I could have a process by which they scatter to some higher K magnon, and that leaves the mode, so that's the damping rate. Um, and normally I think this is only gonna happen in high amplitude, but actually um, if I have defects in my material, then that can provide the extra spatial frequency necessary to turn on this process. Um, so that is definitely like a materials and device kind of a, a, a question. Um, then there's the inhomogeneity of the material. So if I just, for instance, have some variation in the internal anisotropies, and the sample, then different parts of the sample come into resonance at different times. That's something I want to avoid. And then finally, there's this um, TLS or two level system damping. And the superconducting circuits people will immediately recognize this because it is something that is sort of the, the, the fly in the ointment for you know, superconducting circuits and something that everybody is working on kind of all the time. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about that. I won't. Uh, go into too much of the details. Um, there has been some theory and a few experiments on this. Um, what you see is that when you cool these things down to low temperature, contrary to your intuition, the line width blows up. Okay, it gets really large. And this is because you have interactions now with not saturated paramagnetic spins that couple uh, to your magnetic mode. Um, this was discovered in the 1950s for Yitzhir, Meyer, and Garnet, and these spheres are kind of the best results of research from 1960. Um, but in th that's sort of still state of the art. Um, there's a bunch of parts to this. There's the thermal dynamic of just saturation of the paramagnetic spins, and then there's this like extra term that this sort of prefactor where which is actually causing this line shape that is kind of a resonant effect. Um, and so it depends on like, what's the frequency of these uh, two level systems. So this is something that turns on at low temperature that can make the dissipation worse. Okay, um, so I, I guess what I've been hammering home here is that everybody in the field has been thinking about um, starting with the lowest damping materials but they always start with the lowest room temperature damping materials. We're gonna do the same thing but we're gonna try to look at a different one. Um, and the material that we're going to look at is very goofy from the, you know, condensed matter physics standpoint, um, because this is an organic magnetic material. And you think organic magnetic material, this is crazy. 
Um, in fact, it, it's uh, the, the, the best organic magnetic material that, that humankind has so far discovered. Um, it has a Curie temperature of 600 Kelvin. So exchange is actually quite strong in this material. Um, it's a fairy magnet. Uh, it has a pretty small saturation moment of the order of 100 Orsted. And it's uh, you know, a super exchange where you have a spin on the vanadium atom and then super exchange through the TC and E ligand onto this uh, vanadium atom. I'm gonna, this is vanadium tetracyanoethylene. I'm just gonna call it VTC and E throughout. This is grown by my collaborator, Zeke Johnson Halperin. Zeke is a physicist, not a chemist, but he learned how to make this material from a chemist and then took a kind of grower's approach and made it good. And so this is really the thing that um, is gonna be enabling for much of the research. Now, some of the things that are worth noting about this material is that it has exceptionally narrow fMR uh, responses. So this is exactly what you would tend to see in the best YIG films. Um, so here we're showing uh, fMR line width and sort of standard X band fMR at around one Gauss. Actually, I think the record is about 0.6 Gauss. Um, and if you work out the Gilbert damping in the usual way, uh, the record number here is four times 10 to the minus five, which is an exact tie for YIG spheres. So it's actually really good material. Um, just like YIG, by the way, you never, not every time you get a sample, is it going to be the world record sample? That's sort of true throughout all. Okay. Um, so the, the, another thing that's interest to us about this material is that it is grown with a very gentle growth. So one of the challenges for YIG, if you ever try to get YIG to grow, you have to grow it at high temperature and it has to be on a lattice mesh substrate. Um, unfortunately, that means that you have to grow the YIG first and then somehow put it onto the superconducting circuit because the superconducting circuit does not like high temperature conditions. It does not like to be annealed, okay? On the other hand, this material, we can make it grow on any substrate. Lattice matching is not required and it only grows at 60 degrees C. So that means that we can make our superconducting circuit as good as we can in a separate process and then just put this material on it. Yeah. It's not registered. In fact, this material is amorphous, but it's also not polymerized. So um, it, it's, you know, all the TCNEs are bonded to the vanadiums. Maybe that's what you mean by polymerized. I'm... Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of amorphous in the way that amorphous silicon is amorphous. So, you know, there's kind of local uh, order, but not long range. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, so, and then the third ingredient, which is I think very important for what we're doing here, is that you can actually pattern this material in a very simple way. You just do regular EBM lithography. So you make some template with PMMA um, with an undercut and you stick this thing in the reactor and it grows. And then using the magic of chemistry, uh, you can dissolve the PMMA and not the vtc &E, allowing for a liftoff process and that leaves behind some very clean, well-patterned, well-defined structure, which Zeke's group showed a couple of years ago, doesn't affect the Gilbert damping coefficient, the viscous damping of the material. So you're able to produce really high quality magnetic samples that you can actually just lay out in CAD. And to me, that's very powerful and very, very interesting. Okay. So, uh, here's the approach that we've taken on this. Um, so we decided to make the, the resonator, the superconducting resonator, a lumped element type, which just means that it's LC. So the, the C is the capacitor, interdigitated capacitor teeth over here. And the L is just the like short, uh, there's a, a wire shorting that capacitor that has some inductance associated with it. And uh, we want this to be a low impedance uh, characteristic impedance resonator. So there's a lot of current concentration through this wire 
and then we pattern uh, the vanadium tetracyanoethylene on that wire, and it inductively couples the spins in that material to the current uh, that, that circulates in and out of that, that wire um, in the mode that we want. Um, we have the standard uh, cavity magnonics Hamiltonian. So we have the resonator energy, we have uh, the magnon uh, energy, and then we have the coupling term. This is exactly like um, other people have done in the field. Okay, um, so here is our sample after it is fully fabricated. Um, so we fabricate these devices in our clean room at Cornell. We do the EV lithography. We send that sample to Ohio State. They grow the material. Important detail is they encapsulate the material. So just like the organic LED display on your cell phone is air sensitive, so is this material vtc &E. So we solve the problem the same way. We uh, put down epoxy inside of a glove box and we press a cover slip on top of it. And that keeps the air from getting in, denaturing the material. Then they can take it out of the glove box, mail it to us, we can put it into our uh, cryostat and make a measurement. That's all there is to it. In fact, you can see here, this is where the epoxy kind of front ended on the encapsulation of this device. This is where the uh, resist was exposed for alignment marks. And this has vtc and &E deposited there as a result. And you can see that it's denatured, where over here it's not denatured. And if you zoom in on this wire, so this sort of bright thing is niobium, and then this sort of gray strip sitting on top of it, that's the magnetic material that we're going to be coupling to. OK. Um, so we're going to just walk through the measurements now, um, starting with the resonator characterization. Um, so the loaded quality factor of this bare resonance when it's detuned from the magnon resonance is uh, around 4,000. That's not humongous. We want our resonator to be uh, coupled well enough to the transmission line so that uh, we can extract photons from it very efficiently if the magnons turn out to be lossy. Um, so we're, we're operating with a frequency of about 3.6 gigahertz. And so this gives us a line width of about uh, 0.8 megahertz or so. Um, all right, so then uh, we, we then can measure this uh, resonator response as a function of magnetic field. And what we see is this characteristic avoided crossing like I showed you on previous slides. So this is not new, certainly. Um, lots of people have made strongly coupled systems. Um, the devil is in the details, right? So let's look at the details. Um, again, what we're interested in is the size of the gap that determines this coupling G. Uh, the line widths as they change um, into this avoided crossing region, and that is going to tell us this magnon damping. Okay. The other thing, uh, before I go into the details of the device, I want, we, we noticed right away, like if I put this thing on a scale where I see these uniform mode responses very strongly, then everything just looks very simple. But if I saturate the color scale and make a finer measurement in field steps, then I see other things <laughs> popping out, which is in addition to the uniform magnon modes here, I see these other modes that are showing up and I'll come back to those. So just hold on to that. All right, so let's just walk through the details of the coupling. Um, so <clears throat> the main things that are interesting here, we already told you about the resonator is about just under one megahertz. Um, the magnon line width we can extract is 30 megahertz. That was kind of a disappointment at first. So, you know, with YIG, so it is a record for planar devices. Good, that's nice. But, uh, you know, YIG was getting, you know, planar YIG was getting 50 megahertz. So 30 megahertz is sort of incrementally better. Okay. Um, the coupling rate is quite nice. Um, it's 90 megahertz. That's basically twice the, the distance between these two on resonance peaks. And then that puts the cooperativity of around 10 of the three. So this is good. It's high quality. It's certainly good enough that you can start thinking about doing interesting things because both the magnon mode and the resonator mode are much smaller than the coupling rate. Um, however, uh, let's, let's go a little bit deeper because really we kind of came at this from a material standpoint. Like we wanna try a different material. We wanna see if 
that can offer some opportunities that are not available um, in other materials. And one thing that we noticed right away is when you look at these other features, interesting things are happening. So in this picture, I'm showing you, I have a, I, I don't know if the contrast to the screen is good enough, but you're seeing a lot of orders of these Magnon modes. And I have two kinds of modes highlighted. I have the ones with red um, and the ones with white. The ones with red, I understand. The ones with white, I do not understand. Um, and I would be delighted to speak with any of you if you have some ideas, but we tried really hard to understand these white modes and, and we do not. Um, but, the, but the red ones are more clear and also we understand them, so that's good. So what is going on with these red modes? Um, these are thickness quantized Magnon modes. So well, what you normally expect here is that you have this sort of uniform mode resonance, and then you get a shift um, with the K vector of the Magnon, okay? So just to kind of visualize it, if I look on the edge of my sample, so this is 300 nanometers thick in our devices. So now you can get um, node, anti-node, node, where the spins are processing out of phase. And then that, that is going to give you different orders um, with the boundary conditions given by the thickness of, of the sample. Now, uh, one of the things is that you notice right away, these are not really like K squared. Um, and that's a long discussion that we can have. I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, but one of the details is the, sh the cross-sectional shape of this is not actually rectangular. Um, so that's part of it. Um, another part of it is the there appears to be some variation in the saturation moment as a function of depth, meaning as you grow the material, MS changes a little bit. Um, and that then shows up as in the magnon dispersion. Um, that's a detail. It's an important detail, but I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, what I am going to do is try to understand carefully these modes, because if I think about what's going on now, I don't just have a uniform mode coupling. So the sort of subspace that we solved before is just the resonator and the uniform mode magnon coupled by G. But now what we have is additional magnon modes that I'll label with one and two and so on. And they're coupled each to the resonator with some different strength of coupling. In fact, what we expect is that the strength of coupling should decrease as the order decreases because the total net processing dipole is also decreasing. Um, so with that understanding, we can use the standard input-output theory to calculate what we should expect to see in our experiment. And what we see is an excellent match for what we do see. Um, so this uh, is, is essentially reproducing. It's not a fit. It's also not no free parameters. We had to do some by hand parameter picking. Essentially, there's, two, there's like 30 free parameters here. So the fit became untenable. Um, but we were able to reproduce the behavior with the sort of reasonable parameters. So I want to walk through those parameters because they're interesting. Um, so first of all, here's the you know, LC mode. Here's the uniform or Cattell mode parameters. The, the, the damping rate of that mode is 30 megahertz, as I said before. Now, if we look at the Magnon mode, we first can look at the coupling. And as we go up in order, the, in the index of the Magnon mode, the coupling becomes smaller. That's expected again, because I have a smaller and smaller net processing dipole as the material essentially internally compensates. So that is physically expected. Um, the other thing is that the line width is getting smaller. And the line width is getting smaller is quite interesting. So the uniform mode line width is 30 megahertz, which I said was a little bit initially disappointing. But now when we look at the highest order modes, they're down at the same mode line width as the Yig spheres. And that is telling us that the kind of fundamental damping internal, internal is not limiting the line width of this material. It is in fact external things, possibly coupling to other electromagnetic modes that are lossy, um, possibly uh, two level systems that are outside the material that couple more weakly now um, that the, the field that comes out of the sample is different. Okay. Um, so from a material standpoint, this is a very exciting finding because it tells us that this is in fact a high quality material to do these experiments with. But we need to be able to design our system so that we don't have 30 megahertz, we have one 
or even further below. Okay, good. Um, and I just want to quickly, you know, I didn't pull these line widths out of my hat. So if you look at the raw data, you can see that these narrow line widths are happening. So these are just different line cuts. And the progression is exactly the way that I described. Okay. Um, so the, the main point here is that uh, it, it really implies that we have still a lot to learn about what are the sources of line width or, or dissipation in low temperature magnetic experiments. We simply just don't know that. Um, and it seems like a lot of design is going to be needed. For instance, we could just be coupling to leaky modes in the environment, and we don't know that. All right, I'm going to have to move forward. I'm going to skip this because I think I'm going to run out of time for the second part. We did some time domain experiments. Yeah, good. All right, so um, just to conclude this part, um, we, what we demonstrated is a high quality cavity magnetic system with a cooperativity exceeding a thousand. Um, the magnons are really in the low damping limit. Um, using these materials, we can, you know, the fact that we can do lithographic patterning helps us a lot. We're really excited by this because we can just draw pictures now on napkins and then make it in the laboratory, which is what we're uh, working on doing. And then, you know, this really, clean system allows us to see new things about the magnets. Okay, so with that, I wanna switch gears quite a bit. Um, and I'm gonna talk about room temperature optically detected magnetic resonance of single spins in gallium arsenide. So th there's gonna be some whiplash here, I apologize. All right, um, so first of all, I'm gonna throw a term around that you may have heard, may not have heard. We use a lot is called color centers. This is an old term. It comes from the gem industry. A lot of the stuff that we do in the diamond world comes from the gem industry, right? So the reason these gems have color are color centers. So inside, you know, if you think about these materials, these are just wide band semiconductors or insulators, right? So diamond, silicon carbide, sapphire, things like this. And they have deep levels. When you have a defect, you get electronic states that exist in the band gap. The internal transitions of these electronic states can emit and absorb light. And so they act a lot like an atom or a molecule trapped in some vacuum, except the vacuum is the band gap of the material. Um, in diamond, the, the famous example is the NV center, the nitrogen vacancy center. I'll say more about that. But there's a host of others, um, and they're interesting in quantum information. I mean, in particular, um, we care a lot about the properties of that optical transition, and we also care if the, the color center has a spin. And if it has both of those things, and we're lucky, it might, we might be able to read out the spin through the optical transition. So that's what we're after. Um, now, this ability to do both of those things, have a spin, have an optical transition, read one out through the other, has enabled color centers to have some very interesting applications. One of them is quantum sensing. Um, this is kind of the famous example where you put an NV center at the end of a scanning probe tip and you read out the magnetic field through the Zeeman effect optically. There's also the quantum networking application where people are thinking about using these color centers to make quantum repeaters. Um, the idea here is I have some color center over here where there's a electron spin, even a nuclear spin, an electron spin and a nuclear spin, and the optical transition can carry the spin information, and then I can entangle them with some kind of Bell state optical measurement. This idea of all quantum systems has been pushed the hardest using the NV center in diamond by Ronald Hansen's group at Delft. So this is something that is probably a little bit farther from the commercialization, this, these things you can go by, these things you cannot go by, um, but it is certainly clear that color centers have penetrated into the quantum world as an important player. So let me just remind you, some of you know, some of you don't know about the properties of the most famous example, which is the Envy Center in Diamond. Um, I like to think of it as the rubidium of color centers because it's the one that we know the most about and it's a very good one. 
Um, here is the optical cycle of the NV center. Uh, it sits within the band gap of diamond. There's orbital states here. This is an optical transition. There's spin states in both the ground and the excited state. This is a cycling transition, okay? And uh, what makes this system very interesting is that there's this alternate relaxation pathway by which some of the spins, in this case, plus one and minus one, relax through this pathway at a higher rate than the zero spin projection. And what that means is that when I measure photoluminescence of an NV center, if the spin projection is zero, then I get more photons out than if the spin projection is minus one or plus one. That is kind of the powerful thing. Um, in fact, this contrast is about 30%. Um, that's really technologically valuable. It's just very easy readout. And as well as NV centers have pretty long spin coherence, even at room temperature. If you go to low temperature, it gets better. You get a narrow optical transition. You can do things like single shot readout based on resonant excitation of the optical, the spin dependent optical transitions. Okay, so this is all very cool. Um, however, uh, in addition to the virtues, there are also some vices, right? Um, NV centers have a very small Debye Waller factor. So optically, they're not that great. They emit only 4% of the photons coherently. The other 96% are emitted with vibrational information and printed on them, and so they're useless. Um, they are uh, susceptible to spectral diffusion of that optical transition. That's important for the quantum networking application. And of course, I think the one that I'm gonna address most strongly here is that diamond is kind of artisanal. So like, you know, for thousands of dollars, you can buy a piece of diamond that's of millimeter scale. This is not sort of unworkable, it's workable, but it's painful, okay? And so, you know, more uh, scalable commercial kinds of materials would be beneficial. And this has motivated a search for quantum quote, quantum defects or color centers in, in different materials that are not, you know, gems. Um, and this was kind of kicked off by David Auschlam way back in 2010, when they focused mainly on silicon carbide and did some beautiful work in that direction. And people have continued to work on that. Um, so just to note the examples that kind of have been successful, um, I'm gonna focus now only on color centers where there is a spin because color centers without spin are, are much less useful. So uh, I mentioned already silicon carbide. So you have both the di vacancy center and the mono vacancy center. This is a good system. There's mostly no nuclear spins in the lattice of silicon carbide. So you get good spin coherence. Um, unfortunately, the spin contrast from photoluminescence is pretty poor, um, mostly about less than 1%. Uh, there's one exception, it's actually pretty good. Um, it's up to 30%, but it's hard to find that one because there are so many inequivalent versions that when you start creating vacancies, you get everything. So that's somewhat of a problem. Uh, the Debye Waller factor is not very great. It's very similar to the Diamond NV Center, um, but it does have the advantage of being a wafer scale material. Um, the other sort of success story is hexagonal boron nitride. Uh, the, the main defect that people have identified that has a spin uh, that they can read out is the boron vacancy. Um, the spin coherence isn't that long though because of all the nuclear spins in the lattice. Um, it, it's got a very poor quantum efficiency so you can't work with single individual spins. And uh, you know, you can say whether or not van der Waals materials are scalable or not scalable, that's a matter of opinion, but I would generally say not so much. Okay. Um, so we decided to look at gallium nitride. Gallium nitride, as you know, is a commercial material. Um, if you have a, a charger, it probably has gallium nitride in it if it's a relatively new charger. Um, if you have an electric car, it certainly has some in there. Um, so this is what people call a third generation semiconductor and it has sort of robust uh, processing. Um, the vice is that it has nuclear spins. So we're not expecting super high spin coherence here but we thought, well, let's take a look. In fact, people discovered single defects with pretty good optical properties um, back in 2017. So the Debye-Waller factor is actually quite excellent. It's between 
50% and 80%, it depends a little bit defect to defect. That's something that we'd like to understand better. The defect structure is still not known. Um, and so that's actually very hard to figure out just from looking at fluorescence. And so ultimately when people figure out defect structures, they do it by figuring out spin. That's an important clue as to what the electronic states actually are. Um, here is a confocal image of one of these devices um, where you can see that it's pretty easy to individually focus on and isolate one of these defects. Okay, so the questions that I'm gonna try to answer, which I'm not gonna have enough time to finish, but I will, I will speed through. Um, does the gallium nitride defect have a spin? What is the quantization axis? What is the spin multiplicity? You can see that I'm gonna get underwater on this. Um, is it a ground or excited state spin or the alternate option is a metastable spin? And are they good for quantum applications? All right, so the first thing we wanted to do is just figure out a screen. How do we quickly tell if there is a spin? And one way that you can do that is if the fluorescence rate between spin states is different, like the case of an NV center, just apply a magnetic field. If the spin is greater than one, then one of those levels will just shift and become degenerate with the sort of bright or dark state, and then the PL will change. So for instance, you know, in the NV center, minus one will shift down to zero, there'll be an avoided crossing, and in that region, you're gonna get some dip in the magnetic field, in the fluorescence. Um, okay, so we did that. And what we found was in this system, there's actually two different defects that seem to exist. Um, so, you know, very cleverly, we called them group one and group two. Um, group one has, a, now we're applying a magnetic field along the C axis of the crystal. Um, group one, when we do this, uh, the field goes down and then it comes up again. It's very suggestive of the feature that I showed you with an avoided crossing. And group two, it just goes down and stays down, okay? Um, all right, so uh, the immediate thing, once you see that there's a magnetic response, you know there must be some coupling between spin and optical properties. So you immediately think, let's do a magnetic resonance experiment. Um, so here's my generic Hamiltonian for any spin of uh, S greater than one. Okay, so I need, my ingredients are, I need some microwaves, I need to do fluorescence, and I hope uh, the states are going to show me a contrast when I come into one of these resonances by just mixing these spin states bright with dark. And I'm gonna characterize that in terms of the contrast. Just get a hook out whenever, okay. Um, so we have to make a device, we put a little microwire next to the solid immersion lens to enhance the defect. And we look at the group one and we see two resonances, negative sign, couple percent contrast. We look at the group two, we see positive sign, large amplitude, 30%, that's nice, um, positive contrast. So very different behavior. So we have two clearly different defect species happening. Um, with likely different spin multiplicity. So we need a spin one to explain two resonances. We need a spin three halves to explain three resonances. Um, so, you know, when you, one of the questions that we need to figure out is the symmetry axis. This is maybe I can skip over. The key point is, is that you can adjust the angle of the magnetic field and figure out what is the total direction of, of the spin uh, Z axis determined by the lattice. Um, the punchline is that both of them are along the A plane, but they're not along a bond direction. So we were sort of hoping that it, like in vCenter, it would be like, you know, carbon to carbon or something like that. It is not. Um, it is something very different than that. And so we think that there must be some interstitial in there. This is theorists among the audience. This might be an interesting problem to work on. Just a thought. Okay. Um, all right, so we can go a little further in the spectroscopy. Um, we can fit the group one defects with a D parameter equal to roughly the E parameter of about 400 megahertz. And the group two, we can fit that with roughly um, E zero and D 370 megahertz. Um, I do wanna point out, however, and is it showing up on this screen? There is another, uh, G equals four thing. Uh, you can't see it here. This is all washed out, unfortunately. Okay, 
uh, fine. I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, this is interesting, but I'm out of time and I don't want to keep you guys here longer. So uh, the punchline is we did some time domain experiments to figure out if the spin is in this metastable state or in the ground and excited state by doing a pulsed experiment. And it's in the, for group one, it's in the metastable state. For group two, it's in the ground state and the excited state. Okay. And uh, this is my last slide of real data. So um, ultimately, of course, people do care about spin coherence. Um, so for the group two, where there's a ground state spin, we uh, looked at it on each of the three spin three halves transitions. So the minus three halves to a half and a half to three halves have essentially the same coherence time in a Rabi experiment. We can have a discussion about what that means, but it's roughly 100 nanoseconds. That's comparable to boron nitride, uh, what people have seen there. And then the minus a half to a half is short. And that's interesting. Um, it, it's saying that it's probably just because it's resonant with all of the paramagnetic impurities in the crystal. It's probably a lot of G equals two paramagnetic impurities there. So that's probably dominating spin coherence. Okay. Um, so I have a summary of everything that we learned from here. We still don't know the nature of these defects but we now do know a lot about them. Um, we know their spin quantization axis. We know where the spin is, whether it's in metastable or ground. We know the minimum spin needed to explain the you know, what we see in the experiment. We know the abundance. Um, we know uh, the ODMR contrast that we can get, and we know the spin coherence of the ones that have the ground state spin. So that is my last slide. If that clock is right, then I'm probably finishing about the right time, right? So, good. Thank you. Okay. Any papers open for questions? Or talk is open for questions. Okay. Well, people are online. They want to hear your question too. Um, so my question is about the angle, the 27 degree angle of the spin quantization axis. Is that consistent across the different color centers that you find, or is that an average value? We've only measured it super carefully in one defect. I understand. So okay. I, I don't know. I mean, I know that we measured one of each group really carefully. Those measurements take forever, unfortunately. Um, so it is on our list to look at that carefully. You know, if it's an interstitial, um, I, I don't know that it has to be uniformly the same. Although what I will say is we have looked at the, we, we've assumed that it's the same on different defects and looked at the ODMR spectrum, which is faster to measure on the group two, especially. And they all give an exactly identical spin Hamiltonian. So D is the same, E is the same, everything is the same. And so my suspicion is it will be reproducible um, because if it were dramatically different, then we would see a different Hamiltonian because the Z axis is important and determined. I hope that answers your question. Um, I have a question. So you said you weren't trying to make a connection between the two projects, but uh, for the gallium nitride, is it possible to deposit on like a superconductor just like what you did on the first project? I think we could do the other way around. So gallium nitride requires high temperature growth. Um, the superconductor don't like, but we could do gallium nitride as a substrate for growing superconducting materials. Actually, what's interesting is the gallium nitride is, lad is like, epitaxially compatible with like niobium nitride and materials like that. So that, that could be pretty interesting. Um, I know this is probably not good practice, but do you have any wild guesses for these mysterious lower modes in the VTCE? Uh, no, I really don't. So, you know, the, the Magdon literature is pretty robust in terms of like what possible modes could exist. 
So the fact that they're lower in frequency than the uncoupled magnon mode um, it immediately suggests they're backward volume modes, okay? The problem is, there's two problems. The first problem is that they're quantized modes. Quantized modes will require some quantization, some you know, characteristic dimension, and it has to be short. And so those modes only exist propagating along the direction of the magnetic field, which is along the 0.6 millimeter length of the, of the magnetic material. So there's really no way that that is quantizing them with that spacing. Um, so it can't be backward volume modes. And those are the only modes that make sense in the geometry. So we're a little puzzled. And it could be that there's some weird hybridization with the cavity that we don't understand. I don't know. That's the short answer. I think we should end it right there.